Thank you so much. So welcome again, everybody. We're gonna be um, talking today about back to school health and safety protocols. This is part of the face-to-face -face programming um, as part of Pearing University. And today we have Ali Sontag from uh, Department of Student Health and Wellness with us is gonna be our speaker today. So Ali, thank you so much for joining us again. If you wanna introduce yourself to uh, our participants, please. Absolutely. Hello, everyone. My name is Ali Sontag. I'm a nurse practitioner in the Office of Student Health and Wellness here at Chicago Public Schools. Um, a little bit about me is that I am a proud CPS graduate. Uh, I am K-12 educated here at Chicago Public Schools. My whole family works for the district. My mom taught at Wells High School for 42 years. Uh, my husband, who I met at CPS, is now a teacher at our high school. Uh, we went to Peyton together. Um, so we are a very strong CPS family. Uh, I never thought I'd end up working here. I decided to go into nursing and not into teaching to my family's dismay. Uh, and then I ended up getting a job here. Um, I've been working here for now. Up, This is my third school, fourth school year. Uh, wow, time flies. And um, in a non-COVID world, my focus was really on coordinated care um, for our students. And then in a COVID world, I, as Bernice will tell you, uh, do a little bit of everything COVID. Um, I've done, I set up the contact tracing program, um, done some training and supports for that. Um, if anyone is also a CPS employee, you will have heard my voice on a wide variety of trainings that we offer to all of our staff on COVID on a quarterly basis. Um, my passion, uh, so I'm a family nurse practitioner. Um, my undergraduate degrees in cell and molecular biology and African diaspora and African history. I have a master's in clinical nursing leadership from Rush here in Chicago and a doctorate in family practice from Rush. Um, School-aged children are my life's work. They are the population that I want to be serving whether I'm in schools or not. And so in a pandemic world, I am glad that I'm able to be here to support both our students and our staff. Um, my, you know, as a family nurse practitioner, it's uh, from the day you were born to the day you die, I can take care of all of, all of that range. So um, I am very excited to be here um, at Chicago Public Schools and to answer some of your questions today. Fantastic. Thank you, Ali, for, for your introduction. And just know that we're in good hands to ask all these health questions that I know many of us as parents have. So Ali, I think um, you have rights to share your screen. So if you want to share your screen for the presentation, you can go ahead. All right. Can everyone see it? That looks good. Yes, we can see it. And for the interpreters, I will do my very best to speak slower. Um, I know that sometimes when I get excited about a topic that I speak very quickly, um, so I will make a conscious effort to slow down my speech a little, um, as I know that we are doing live interpretation, which makes me very happy, because um, I do want this information to be accessible to as many people as possible. So a little bit about the Office of Student Health and Wellness. Our aim is to remove health-related barriers to learning and advance child health, all, all health equity here in Chicago. Our office does a lot of things from health promotion, from sex ed and recess to health information, to student health services like vision and hearing and dental. We also operate our school-based health centers. We have our children and family benefits unit that help families enroll in Medicaid and SNAP benefits. We also do contact tracing and we support our nursing program. So what is the whole child? It is, you know, WISC is the topic of, of our conversation today. And supporting the whole child is our commitment to supporting a student, every student in every school, so that they are healthy, safe, supported, challenged, and engaged by really seeing them as part of a larger system. So knowing that in order to engage those students, our students in that way, we really need to surround them in resources um, and then really make sure that those resources are grounded in our communities. The objective of this presentation is to talk through some health and safety protocols in our schools. And at the end of this presentation, uh, we hope that you'll have learned something more about how to protect yourself and your child, uh, and specifically about variants and vaccines. We know we get a lot of questions on this and we wanna be as trans transparent as possible. So what is coronavirus, the million dollar question of the last 18 months? So coronavirus belongs to a family of viruses. Um, pre-COVID, uh, they made up about 10 to 30% of the cases of the common cold every year. Um, they are called coronavirus because they look like they have a little crown, as you can see in that photo. 
I don't really see it, but sure. Um, COVID, co coronavirus 2019, which is when it was identified, COVID-19, was a new virus. So that's why we often called it novel. Um, at this point, it's part of our everyday lives, uh, whether we want it to be or not. Um, so we will go through some basics on COVID-19 uh, just to make sure that you know we're all on the same page and using the same terms. But I recognize that this is something that we've talked a lot about um, in both school and in our personal lives. So variants. So co coronavirus is the family of viruses. COVID-19 is the specific virus. And within COVID-19, we're seeing something called variants. And, and variants transparently are expected. Um, it's kind of what viruses do. It's why viruses are still around is because they're able to mutate. And so how variants work is through this constant changing. So you can see in the photo of my trees, the tree in the middle, we're gonna call that COVID-19. And you can see that there are different branches on that tree. It's still the same tree, right? But the branches might look just a little different. And that's what happens when something mutates. It looks a little different. Mutations are constantly happening in viruses. Some mutations make viruses less effective and some make them more effective, that they do more. They're more contagious, more transmissible, more deadly. Um, we're in a place in the pandemic now where we've started naming our variants, right? Alpha, beta, gamma, and then delta. And the reason we name them, we name the variants that are worse for us, um, that are more transmissible or more problematic. There are lots of variants that will never be named because they actually make the virus weaker and therefore they're not a problem for us. So thinking about the Delta variant, which is our most recent variant, it is the predominant variant here in the United States. Delta variant was also the predominant variant in India and in the UK. Their Delta spikes were earlier than ours. Uh, we are kind of moving through our Delta uh, increase and now Delta is the predominant variant here. It very likely will not stay the predominant variant. That's the nature of this virus. There will be other variants that may grow to replace it. Um, so just, you know, we're talking about Delta today, but the named variants, and we'll keep naming them in order of the Greek alphabet as they show up, um, is how we'll kind of keep track of the slight changes. And so the Delta variant we do know causes more infections and spreads faster than the Alpha variant or the original, original flavor of COVID. Um, we know it is contagious, um, that it is more contagious than the original COVID strain, um, but we also know that it, it is really what we're seeing is in unvaccinated populations where this continues to be a problem and recognizing, right, being transparent here, we know that everyone under the age of 12 is part of that population. And so when I, when I talk about unvaccinated people, I recognize that our children are part of that population, not by choice, just by the nature of how the approval process is. And so when we talk about this, you know, I am cognizant of the fact that our students are part of that group. There is really good news though. Vaccines are highly effective against Delta variant. Um, I think there was a most recent study I saw out of um, Los Angeles. It showed that people who were unvaccinated were five times more likely to get COVID compared to vaccinated. Um, that means the vaccines work, that they are powerful, right? We still do have breakthrough cases. Vaccinated people can test positive. And it's a combination of a couple things. Um, one, we think that the vaccines do have some waning effects over time. So there's the conversations around boosters that are happening kind of nationally right now. And the other one is we know that there is a population of people whose immune systems just did not raise a strong enough response. And that was the most recent adjustment that the FDA moved through by approving a third dose uh, for people who are immunocompromised, uh, moderate to severe immunocompromised people. And um, then they recommended a third dose. This is basically to make sure their immune system really kicks in and is able to fight this off. Um, and it was one of the closely studied populations, specifically transplant patients. Um, the other things we know about Delta though, is that it does work like COVID. And so that all of our layered mitigation strategies masking, hand washing, social distancing, that they do work against it. Um, and so while it is slightly different than the original strain of COVID, we know that the same techniques work. 
So COVID-19 is primarily spread from person to person. It is uh, primarily droplet formed, which is why masks work for source control. So as you're speaking, if you put your hand in front of your, your mouth, you'll feel tiny little droplets of moisture on there. That's what that's how droplets are spread. And so when you wear a mask, those droplets are captured in the mask. Um, it is primarily spread between person to person. We define a close contact as someone who is less than six feet apart for greater than 15 total minutes of a positive person, whether or not you're wearing a mask. We know masks help um, and they really do. The data continues to hold out that masks really do help permit, prevent transmission, um, but we're not sure exactly how much. And so it is close contact regardless of masking status. Um, we also know that we see the most transmission happen um, inside a household. And that makes sense, right? We're home. I don't wear a mask in my house. Um, I share a bathroom with my spouse. Um, it's, we're very in close quarters. And so that makes a lot of sense. And we can continue to see that throughout the pandemic as household spreads. So let's talk about types of exposure. So on the far left here, we have our infected individual, our positive person. Um, when we're talking about a close contact that less than six feet apart for greater than 15 total minutes, we're really talking about a first degree exposure. We're talking about a person who came in contact with a positive person while they were contagious. And people are contagious while symptomatic and two days before. In the case of not having symptoms, but you just tested positive, we use your test date. So it's from the date of testing in two days prior. And that's what we call it. Well, that's when someone is contagious and can get other people sick. That lasts for 10 days. So from your date of test, if you have no symptoms or your first symptom, you're contagious 10 days forward. And so anyone who comes in close contact with a person during that time is considered a first degree exposure. If you are vaccinated, we, you do not have to quarantine. Um, but we do recommend that you test three to five days after exposure. And if you are unvaccinated, you need to quarantine for 14 days and get tested. And you need to complete your 14 day quarantine regardless of your negative testing. So that's our first degree exposure. So that is someone who's come in very close contact with a positive person. Then there are second degree exposures. And those are people who came in contact with a first degree exposure. Those people don't have to quarantine or isolate unless that first degree exposure becomes positive. So we can see that there are kind of differing degrees. And we use this just to say that we, you know, we recognize COVID will happen and that we will be quarant, you know, people will get quarantined, but there's also going to be people who may have been in the same area or in the same building as a person, but is not a close contact. They don't have to quarantine um, or negative test because they're in that second or third degree exposure. So who can get sick? Anyone can get sick, but we know that unvaccinated people are at a much higher risk of getting sick. And in that uh, Los Angeles study, unvaccinated people were 20 time, 29 times more likely to get hospitalized than a vaccinated person if they became COVID positive. That's massive. That is, that is showing us that vaccines work. Um, Children data is a little different. Um, we know that children, while can get COVID and they can get Delta, right? We're seeing that it does act slightly differently in adults and children. And it could be for a couple of different reasons. Um, one is just children have smaller lungs. Um, so transmission might be, we think is lower in those groups, but we do recognize that this does happen in children. Um, and the best thing we can do for our kids who cannot get vaccinated is to do something called cocooning. And that means that anyone in that child's life who can get vaccinated does get vaccinated. And basically we can surround children in a layer of vaccine, even though they cannot get vaccinated themselves if they are under the age of 12. It's one of the reasons Chicago Public Schools has chosen to mandate that all teachers get vaccinated unless they have a documented religious or medical exemption. Um, and then they'll be tested on a weekly basis. That mandate is really important as another layer of mitigation, recognizing that our children under the age of 12 don't qualify for vaccine, they're ineligible, but we can surround them by adults who are. Um, and that will cut down on the total amount of 
COVID in our schools um, and that we can transmit to our students by protecting them with other vaccinated individuals. Um, we also know that many people who have COVID have very mild symptoms or no symptoms at all. This is why universal masking is important in our schools. Um, it is universal masking period, the end. Um, there's a handful of exceptions uh, that are called out students with medical conditions um, that have a documented reason that they can't tolerate a mask are allowed to apply for an accommodation similarly to staff. But without an, a recognized accommodation, everyone wears a mask every day. So let's talk about some symptoms of COVID-19. We've got kind of the big, uh, the big three, fever, cough, and shortness of breath. Um, we know that these are symptoms. They are not, in fact, the most common symptoms today. And those are kind of our, our, our biggest symptoms. We know that people also have chills, aches and pains, nasal congestion, runny nose, sore throat, diarrhea, and the new loss of taste or smell. Um, those are kind of some of the ones that we've learned along the way. Um, symptoms can appear anywhere from two to 14 days after exposure. And then what happens if your child has any of those symptoms? If these are new symptoms, right? New nasal congestion, new aches and pains, new fatigue, you, we need to get tested. And that's really what this comes down to. Um, the only way to know that you don't have COVID is to get tested. Um, this is just a thing we have to do to take care of ourselves and our community. Now, I will say that I have, I have chronic allergies. Uh, spring and fall are not my friends. Summer and winter are lovely. And um, for the last 18 months, whenever there's a change of season and I go from being kind of my normal level of congestion to feeling worse, to being more congested than I was the day before, if I'm feeling fatigued, if I'm having new symptoms that are not my baseline, I go to get tested every time. And I have to take my own advice on this. Um, we know that this creates some challenges, but really the only way to know is to get tested. I can, oh, I can talk about temperature checks, absolutely. So um, fever, while it is a symptom of COVID, fever is actually not a great screening technique for COVID, to prevent the COVID from entering the buildings. Um, fever for a couple of reasons. One, fever is cyclical. It's based on our circadian rhythms a little bit. So people don't have fevers all of the time, even when they have a fever. We've also learned from COVID specifically that fever is not the predominant symptom. I think I read one study where less than 30% of people who tested positive for COVID and were hospitalized, so they were really sick, ever had a fever. Um, and fever also tends to be a late stage infection. So later on, and then in kids, there is a, 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 um, a process called MISC, which has that high fever component. And MISC actually occurs weeks after the child is no longer contagious with COVID. It's a reflective disorder or like a responsive disorder from the immune system. And it happens weeks later and fever is a predominant symptom there, but the child's not actually COVID positive or contagious anymore. So we've learned a lot in the last 18 months. We've all, we, one of the things we've learned is that temperature checks is not a, an effective screening technique. Now, if a child becomes sick during the day, we will take their temperature, um, but it is not a, a, a good filter for universal protocols. Let's briefly talk about some COVID vaccines. Um, so how do vaccines work in general? You can see this is a lovely picture from the World Health Organization. So um, every virus is kind of coated in antigens and those antigens are how our body knows what it is. And once we've been exposed to a new virus, our body makes these antibodies and they're a perfect match for the virus antigen coat. When we have a new pathogen, we don't have any antibodies. So what vaccine does is it skips the part of us being exposed and it teaches our body with showing it a little piece of the pathogen of the virus in this case, what, how to make an antibody. So it teaches us how to make our own antibodies without ever having to get sick. Um, vaccines are kind of amazing in that way. Uh, vaccines work in a couple ways. It protects me as an individual, right? I have those antibodies now. Um, if I get sick, my antibodies are able to uh, kill it off so it doesn't make me very sick. Um, and we see that with breakthrough infections, right? Even if I do become positive, where most breakthrough infections are very mild, not all. 
Um, but most people experience mild symptoms if they do have a breakthrough infection. The other thing is I'm less likely to get sick myself. And so it helps protect the people around me in that cocooning idea. There are three main types of vaccines. So we have mRNA. So that's like Pfizer and Moderna. mRNA based vaccines basically take a strip of RNA, that messenger RNA particularly, that's in the vaccine itself. That messenger RNA is taken through the vaccine into our bodies and it teaches our bodies how to make the spike protein. So just that little piece, not the whole virus, just a single little piece that teaches our bodies how to make an antibody. So it produces that spike protein. Um, the spike protein then causes an immune response. Our immune system then is taught how to make antibodies. There's also two other different types of vaccine um, that are slightly less common here in the US. Uh, there are protein-based protein -based vaccines such as Novavax. And Novavax is literally an, an, a, a vaccine that just has the spike proteins in it. So it, it's just the spike proteins. Instead of with the mRNA, we make the spike protein in our cells. This is the spike protein in a vaccine itself. Um, and Novavax is the only one that I'm aware of that's currently um, in studies that functions in this way. The third type of vaccine we're seeing for COVID is a vector vaccine. And a vector vaccine uses uh, a deactivated virus. So it takes a virus that they make safe. Um, in this case, I believe for Johnson & Johnson, it's an adenovirus. Um, and they insert that mRNA code into the shell virus. And so it uses one virus that has been made safe to carry in that message um, in order to, for our cells to make the spike protein again. So Johnson & Johnson here in the US and then AstraZeneca abroad is done in this vector vaccine way. So what to expect, uh, Pfizer, Moderna, uh, and Johnson Johnson are two sh are shots in the upper arm, either three or four weeks apart, while Johnson & Johnson is a single shot. Um, it takes two weeks for we to, before we consider after your final dose for it to be considered fully vaccinated. Um, and that's because that's typically how long the immune response takes. We know um, from those studies that that group of moderate to severe immunocompromised patients need a third shot. And then two weeks after their third shot, they'd be considered fully vaccinated. And we still, you know, we know this is happening, um, that their breakthrough cases do happen. And so we do need to continue to, to use mitigation techniques, um, hand washing, universal masking. Um, are the vaccines safe? Uh, yes, they've done a lot of studies. Actually, these are very well studied vaccines. Um, both Pfizer and Moderna and Johnson & Johnson got approved through this EUA, this emergency authorization platform. Pfizer has now received full FDA approval for 16 and up, and it has a new name, com commentary. I'm honestly, it's a very hard name to pronounce and that is frustrating to me. Um, I can't imagine how it's actually pronounced consistently. Um, emergency youth authorization allows something to uh, not take as much time, but it still requires rigorous data. And it still requires safety protocols um, that we'll go through here. So all vaccines, whether they're EUA, EUA approved or full FDA, have to go through this preclinical phase one, phase two, and phase three trials. Preclinical is when they're just trying to figure out how this drug works. Phase one is they do a very small study with about 100 volunteers. Phase two, they do exploratory studies in several hundred volunteers. And phase three is thousands of volunteers. This vaccine, these vaccines are some of the most well-studied medications that have ever come to market uh, or there, that are currently on the market because it's so important. Um, the other thing that we want to recognize is that we want to make sure that these studies were done in a diverse group of people so that it's representing people across genders, races, ethnicities, ages, so that it's representative of, of the American people and including just really diverse participant background. Um, which they worked very hard to ensure that the early study styles, the early studies included. Um, some myths about the vaccine. You can't get COVID from the vaccine. All of these vaccines are giving your body 
at the spike protein, basically it, either it's giving it directly or having your body produce a teeny tiny spike protein. It is not a whole COVID virus. It, it will not give you COVID. Um, the vaccine doesn't change or damage your genetic information. These are very local um, vaccines that are looking for Pfizer and Moderna that are delivering DNA into the um, cytoplasm of your cells to make that protein. It doesn't change your DNA. And then if you're vaccinated, we still need you to mask and wash your hands. Um, the risks are a lot lower to yourself and others, uh, but we would need to continue to protect the people around us. If you're interested in getting vaccinated, uh, vaccines.gov, or you can uh, text your zip code to that number or give a call um, and they will find a vaccination location nearest you. Here in Chicago uh, at CPS, we're doing a couple of things. We have three regional sites that are set up in our schools. Um, I believe we'll be adding a fourth site um, shortly. And you can make appointments on these links if you are interested in getting vaccinated at our regional sites. We also have mobile vaccine events um, throughout the city that you can sign up for. The other thing, um, we know COVID has really been, the last 18 months have been a lot. Um, we also wanna call out that your regular pediatric vaccines are very, very important to keep making sure that our children are safe from other things like measles um, and uh, tea, you know, and uh, pertussis and, and those kinds of things. So it's very important that you get in to get your scheduled vaccines. Um, we know that there have been a lot of delays because COVID made things very difficult for a long time. Um, and so, we're also leveraging some of our mobile events for those as well in the schools. Um, we know that kids can get COVID. Uh, we also know that they are generally one of the last subgroups to get tested for clinical trials for vaccines and other drugs. And that is because we wanna make sure that they are very, very safe in a large population before they are studied in children. So there are studies being undergoing for Pfizer, Moderna and Johnson & Johnson in a pediatric population. Um, the last conversation I had on this um, with the Chicago Department of Public Health, our hope is that there will be approval for pediatric vaccines uh, either late this year or early you know, next year. So this winter, basically, um, late fall or early winter is really the hope here. Um, they continue to do these studies and gather information in this population. We know vaccines are important, um, but we also need to make sure that they are safe in this population. So creating safe and healthy learning environments in schools, uh, universal masking. Um, everyone, regardless of their vaccination status, needs to be wearing masks in schools. Uh, this was our policy. It is now state guidance. Um, we aligned with CDC on this. Universal masking uh, needs to be is, is what's happening. Um, a proper mask is worn over your nose and mouth. Uh, we definitely have uh, masks available in our schools for students and staff, um, and then extra masks if needed during the day. We know sometimes things happen, and so we're really trying to problem solve uh, so that we have what's available when, when students need it. Um, home self-screening, so we are moving away from the you know, online CPS screener, and we're moving to a home self-screening model. It's really important that every day before you go into a CPS building that you ask yourself some questions. Are you feeling sick? Are you waiting on a test? You need to stay home. Um, if you've tested positive for COVID, please report to us, cps.edu forward slash COVID results. Um, and then for not vaccinated, there's a couple other things. Uh, if you are a close contact of someone, you need to stay home. And if you've traveled domestically, you need a negative test. Um, if you've traveled to an orange state, uh, and if you've traveled internationally, you need to stay home for seven days and get a test if you are unvaccinated. And that's aligned with CDC guidance. So here is our CDPH guidance. We have a travel advisory here. Um, unvaccinated people traveling from an orange state need to have a negative test uh, within 72 hours of coming to Chicago or upon arrival to Chicago, or they need to quarantine for 10 days. Fully vaccinated individuals who are well do not need to quarantine or test. Um, if you're traveling internationally, vaccinated people are still recommended that they get tested three to five days after travel, but they do not need to quarantine. 
unvaccinated individuals need to get tested three to five days after travel and stay home for seven days. If they're negative, they need to stay at home for 10 days if they do not get tested. So we've talked a lot about what happens, you know, testing and, and what that looks like. So what happens if you're positive or if you're positive, right? Uh, you report to us at cps.edu forward slash COVID results, the individual who's positive or their parent or guardian needs to report. There's information we can only get from the case. Positive cases are directed to isolate from 10 days for their, from their symptom onset. And then close contacts are identified and instructed to quarantine for 14 days if they're unvaccinated. If you're identified, if you, your student is identified as a close contact and we have a vaccine record on file, you will still get notification that that child was a close contact, but you are not being asked to quarantine. Uh, we really wanna be transparent in this process to the greatest degree possible. Um, if there is a vaccination record on file, it will not be asked to quarantine, but you will get notified if you were deemed a close contact. Um, contact tracing has uh, is in-house. We really last year felt that um, we really learned that CPS is unique and our schools are unique. So our contact tracing team is trained um, specifically for schools. They work six days a week, Sunday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. They call our families and our staff whenever we have a positive case. They in, do a case intake. They interview the case, get as much information as they can from the case. Um, and then we work with the schools, right? We recognize that parents know a lot about their kid, um, but they, don't, they may not know everything. You may not know the names of the students in the class. We don't expect you to. Um, we call to get as much information as we can from the family, and then we work with the school directly to get the rest of the information. Um, and then to you know double check, it's really about layering up and getting as much information as we can in order to properly quarantine individuals. Um, so if your student was identified as a close contact, you'll get a letter saying if they're unvaccinated that they need to quarantine. Um, if they are, if we don't have a vaccination status, you will be asked to quarantine. You can submit the vaccination status to us to get released. It, it is sent via email. If we don't have an email address on file, um, we do give families a call to make sure that they've gotten these quarantine instructions. Please make sure that your school has your most updated contact information on file. It is so important that we're able to get in touch with you quickly and efficiently. Um, so please make sure that your school has your most updated information on the file. Um, then we also provide um, our list of close contacts to the Chicago Department of Public Health who call and provide additional support to our CPS students and staff who are deemed a close contact. Um, we really wanna make sure that we're closing the loop that they're getting all of their questions answered. Um, students who are fully vaccinated do not need to quarantine if they are asymptomatic, right? If you're having symptoms, stay home, period, the end. Uh, get tested. If you test negative and your symptoms are better, you can come back to school. But regardless of close contact or not, uh, if you're symptomatic, you need to stay home. Um, we do recommend that even fully vaccinated individuals get tested three to five days after exposure. So what happens if your child gets sick while you're at school? If a child arrives to school with COVID-like symptoms or develops COVID-like symptoms during the day, they will be uh, separated from their classmates and sent to a care room. Um, our care rooms are designed to be um, separate so that students can be isolated from others while still being supervised. Our care room staff will take a temperature, they'll mark the student as present in the care room, and then we'll notify the parent or guardian for pickup. Um, we really wanna make sure that our schools continue to be um, places for healthy learning. So we really need healthy kids in our schools. If your child arrives to school sick, they will be sent to the care room and called, and you will be called for pickup. Um, just as a quick call out here, we do, if your child is sent home from school um, with symptoms of COVID, they need either a negative test or an alternate diagnosis from their doctor when they come back to school. So negative testing or an alternative diagnosis, for example, you know, your child with chronic allergies, right? Um, they need to be evaluated by a medical provider. If that medical provider says, I don't need to COVID test them, it is just insert whatever their chronic condition is, they can provide that to us with documentation to come back to school. If a child does not have either a negative test or an alternative diagnosis, 
they, they will be asked to stay home for 10 days um, from their symptom onset. So it is really important that we're communicating um, with back to the school and the school is communicating to you when your child is sick, they do need to stay home until they get a negative test or an evaluation by a medical provider. So let's talk about social distancing in alignment with CDC guidance, physical distancing, which is another, it's I think probably a more accurate description. Uh, physical distancing for in-person can is now defined as three to six feet for students and fully vaccinated staff. And this was based on studies from uh, last school year. While we know that Delta was not present last school year, we also have things now that we didn't have before, such as vaccination, right? Widespread vaccination. Um, so based on these studies from the 2021 school year, um, what they did is they looked at both here in the US and internationally, um, schools that use six feet of social distancing and then schools that use less than six feet of social distancing, three feet or even no feet of social distancing. And what they found is that kind of regardless of social distancing in a school setting, um, they did not see a huge difference in the amount of in-school transmission that occurred. Uh, this is why they adjusted their guidance to three to six feet for schools. Um, additionally, organizations like the World Health Organization has used one meter as their standard for social distancing. Um, and so we know that, that that's kind of uh, outside of the US, they do use that three foot rule. So in alignment with CDC guidance, we'll be moving to three feet for social distancing in schools. Um, schools need to work with their building managers and school safety committee to maximize social distancing whenever possible. Just because it is uh, a slightly different definition this year doesn't mean that it goes away. Social distancing, we need to be maximizing whenever possible so that we can really ensure that our schools are safe and healthy. Um, communication of cases. so. Positive cases that are reported to contact tracing will be posted on our public website, cps.edu forward slash B2S um, is a quick link to get there. We will be posting um, by school any positive cases, obviously not identifiable, right? Um, we do wanna be transparent, but we also need to work to protect the identities of those individuals who've tested positive. And so you'll see just large aggregate numbers, uh, but it is broken down by school for positive cases. Um, cleaning and disinfection will continue similarly to last year. Um, we are using our enhanced cleaning protocols. We have HEPA air purifiers in classrooms, disinfectant sprayers. There will be sneeze guards in specific locations in the school, such as the main office or the front desk that have high flow with uh, public, um, where the people will be coming you know, in contact with public. Uh, but sneeze guards in other locations are not as recommended as they do change the airflow in some smaller spaces. And so we really want to make sure we're maximizing air exchange. We know that may, that ventilation makes a, dis, a, a, a difference. We also are maintaining our 400 custodians that we hired last year in order to continue with our enhanced cleaning protocols. Okay, I know I have gone through a lot very quickly. I have tried to grab some questions from the chat as they showed up. Um, you can also put your questions directly in the Q&A and we can answer them um, in written form if, you do not, uh, if we do not have time to get to all of them. I'm gonna scroll through the questions real quick yeah, and see if I can pull some ones that I can. So I address temperature checks. Um, so all of our teachers, so the question is, why don't, why don't we wait till all teachers are vaccinated before we open schools? All of our teachers have had access to vaccines since February. Um, vaccination has been something that we have uh, really supported here at CPS um, for our teachers and then for our students and families. Teachers have been able to get vaccinated through the Chicago Public Schools. We set up our own vaccine sites to make sure that they could have access to vaccines. So our teachers are, uh, I think, on our, our, our majority vaccinated. We also have teachers who haven't reported to us their vaccines data. So we're collecting that information. And as we know, kind of um, the percentages of our staff will be continuing to share that on our public website as we have in, in as well as last year. Um, Ali, I think there's a lot of questions about um, 
remote learning. So I don't know if you can touch a little bit on that. I know um, Jamie tried to answer some of those questions, but they keep coming up. So why yeah, sure. So insights. Yeah, so uh, let's talk about, first of all, there is Virtual Academy being offered this year, and that is a specific um, opportunity that we've created for students who are considered med medically fragile. So they have a condition that puts them at higher risk um, and that you know we would like to offer them uh, virtual learning as, as their primary option. And so Virtual Academy accepted applications all summer um, and continues to approve um, those that application pool ended. There are some exceptions. So if you do have questions, please reach out to a virtual enrollment at cps.edu. But that's specifically for students who have uh, a medical condition themselves that puts them at higher risk. Um, we've had students who are transplant patients, you know, students who have some severe underlying conditions that we know um, we want to offer them a way to participate in school without coming in. Um, they're our priority focus. We recognize that there are a lot of complexities around this. Um, the remote learning for other students beyond that uh, will not be available this year. We are five days in person. That being said, we recognize that there are students who will get, will be told to quarantine by CPS, right? They're there will be a positive case in a school. Um, and when that happens and CPS directs a family to uh, their student to quarantine, that student will receive instruction from CPS while they are observing their quarantine. So this is a CPS directed quarantine. Um, this students who are, are symptomatic or who have traveled and need to stay home while waiting on test results, um, those students need to, will take sick days, um, there'll be an excused absence, but there will be a small group of students who have been asked to quarantine by CPS and we will offer uh, instruction to those students while they are at home that will be coordinated through, this, through the school. Um, CPS nursing, I can take that one. Um, will CPS have nurses available in schools every day? Um, Right now, we are quickly trying to scale up our, or we've continued to scale up our nursing during this pandemic. So I think in the last year, we hired uh, I think at least 30 more nurses. We continue to hire. We have a director of nursing now. Um, so nursing continues to grow in CPS. Nurses, um, as we expand, the number of schools that nurses will be asked to take uh, will decrease. So every school has a nurse assigned to them. Uh, they may not be present in the building every day, but that is the goal we are actively working towards um, and trying to get them, get us there as quickly as possible. Ellie, I do have a question here from parent in the Q&A about um, children, siblings, right? If one sibling is quarantined, what happens to the other siblings? Yeah, so there's two different paths for this, right? There's quarantine and isolation. So isolation is what happens when you test positive. Um, so we'll go through that case where a sibling is positive first. So if one sibling tests positive, the other siblings in that household would in all likelihood be considered a close contact because they were less than six feet apart for greater than 15 total minutes while that child was contagious. That Those siblings will be asked to quarantine for 14 days if they are unvaccinated. Um, so that is one way siblings would get quarantined. The other is if, a, if, if only one child is quarantined. So let's say there is a positive case in a classroom, that child has a sibling that goes to a different school. So the child in the classroom, or you know, our sibling number one, will be asked to quarantine because they were a first degree exposure. Our sibling number two, who is not part of that classroom, will not be asked to quarantine. They're considered a second degree exposure. So sibling one will need to quarantine for 14 days, but sibling two can continue in-person learning unless that sibling one becomes a case, right? And then now they're a close contact and we go back to the first scenario. So there, will, there may be times where siblings will be asked to quarantine in case of a close contact, but other oftentimes siblings will be second degree exposures and will not be asked to quarantine.
Thank you for that answer. And I know there's, it's complicated and hard to, I, I mean, I'm still wrapping my hand around it. I know it's hard to understand the first exposure, second exposure. So definitely let's go back to this video um, at a later date and look it over again and again, because I know it's hard to, to understand the first exposure or the second and why some quarantine, some don't. So I know it's hard and we'll keep answering that, that question as much as we can. Um, and I think there's one that last question here, uh, or the last questions that I have on the on the chat about um, if why are vaccinated children if they are asymptomatic now required to stay home if you're still contagious even if vaccinated. So, if you can you ask me that question again, where is this? Sure, is the is the last question? Okay. Um, Okay, so if you are vaccinated and a close contact, I think this is the question. So if you are a close contact and you are vaccinated and you are not experiencing symptoms, you are not required to quarantine. We do recommend that you get tested from day three to day five, but we know that vaccinated individuals are at less, less risk of getting COVID. We know it's, it, breakthrough cases do happen, but the risk is significantly lower. Um, and so that is why we're in alignment with both CDC, CDPH, and IDPH guidance that vaccinated individuals at this time are not being asked to quarantine because the data still says that it that their risk is significantly lower of getting COVID. Um, actually, I'll take this last one as well. I think that's a very reasonable question. I'm not sure if my child can wear a mask for seven hours, uh, especially because she's an asthmatic. Will there be breaks or exceptions? Um, yes. Yeah, so. Universal masking means that while we're in schools, we need to mask. Um, there are a handful of exceptions to this. Um, one is people who medically can't tolerate a mask. Um, through our Office of Diverse Learner Student Supports and our school nurses, there is an accommodation process in which a medical provider can submit documentation that a child can't tolerate a mask. We are gonna work with that child to see what we can tolerate. And that's one of the conversations the school nurse will have. Um, can they tolerate a face shield instead, right? Not, it is not source control in the way a mask is, but it is more than not wearing a mask at all. Does a child just need more frequent breaks? So there's an accommodation process in which you can go through um, for children who really cannot tolerate a mask for a medical reason. Um, but then we're also uh, move, moving to try to create mask breaks in the sense of when we are outside. So we are trying to create, and although it is, very hot here in Chicago and does not feel like it will be cold anytime soon. Um, while our weather is still nice, we are trying to leverage outdoor spaces to the greatest degree possible for meals, for breaks, for classes, for physical education, right? Um, because we know that if someone, you know, is outside that our risk is a lot lower because there's constant air circulation. And so that's one thing that we are encouraging schools to do. Um, while <clears throat> while children are outside in their classroom group, um, right? If they're, if they're mixing two different classrooms together, everyone needs to wear masks. But if it's just your classroom, you're sitting outside and doing an activity, you can have your masks off. And that is in alignment with IDPH guidance um, that while you are outside in your, in your own classroom space, you know, with your own classroom and you're not mixing groups, that we will allow students to kind of take their masks off for, for a mask break. Um, but also so that teachers have the ability to practice some SEL skills, um, especially for our little littles. We know that there are some real advantages to um, facial expressions and those kinds of things. And so we're trying to create safe and healthy ways to practice those skills. Additionally, there are some of our populations which will be wearing clear masks um, for such as our deaf and hard of hearing group. We recognize that that population really does need to see um, faces and lips in order to lip read if that's how if that's how they're one of their communication techniques. And so we are working to try to creatively problem solve um, for, for these issues that come up with masking. But masking is vital. Um, masking will continue in CPS regardless of vaccine status. Um, any other questions? that I can help with. And I will say something about just like 
contact tracing and communication, right? So close contacts will get notified through contact tracing. Um, and then there's kind of larger community notifications. And that once we've made our recommendations um, to the principal that's shared directly with the principal um, to share with the community at large if there is a case. It says some general information about when the case was in the building, um, but it doesn't give the specifics. Anyone who's a close contact will get a separate communication telling them that they need to quarantine or that they were deemed a close contact. For sure. Thank you, uh, Ali. And thank you, Jamie, for, for answering some of those questions uh, in the chat. Really appreciate it. Um, Ms. Cruz, once I get your email, I'll, I'll forward it and send it. And then somebody from the Virtual Academy um, hopefully will be in touch with you. I'll do my best to get somebody um, to contact you tomorrow to see how they can best uh, support you. Yeah, and if you guys have, um, we're going to put all these questions together, add them to the questions from Tuesday, where I know Ali and her team and our team are working hard on trying to answer as many questions as possible and put it on our website for you guys. Um, so make sure you guys look at that, share it with everybody. We'll try to put this video up um, hopefully by tomorrow so you can share it with people over the weekend. As I know, school starts on Monday um, and everybody has a lot of questions and this might be helpful for, for some people. Um, I know somebody wants to meet with me after this. Um, once the seminars are over, it closes automatically. So send me an email and I'll try to, um, we can try to touch bases uh, tomorrow if that's okay. Just send me an email and I put my email in the chat and I can put it again for those folks that um, need to send me an email, send me a message, that kind of stuff, okay? Thank you so much, guys. Uh, Ali, again, thank you so much for giving us your expertise and teaching us a little bit about the vaccines, the virus, how it works, all the things that CPS is doing and the amazing work that the teachers and staff and everybody in the school buildings are doing to keep us safe. I wanna give a, a, a hand and a thank you so much to Irene who's translating um, and to Sylvia, not translating, interpreting, <laughs> to Sylvia and Irene who are interpreters tonight, supporting our Spanish speakers and our Cantonese speakers tonight. Thank you everybody uh, for joining us and giving us some time this afternoon. Please look at our website, RSVP some, for some other sessions that we're going to have. And again, you guys have my emails, shoot me an email with questions um, and I'll try my best to answer them or to provide you guidance to who we need to talk to to answer your question. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, uh, Ellie, for, for doing all of this. And uh, Jamie, thank you so much for answering all these questions in the chat. I really appreciate it. All right, everybody, we're going to close it up. Have a great night, and we'll see you soon.